Happy Sabbath to everybody. And I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm Dr. Joyce Chet, and uh, we are here every Saturday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, where we try to share subject matter that we think that people would be interested, people who are interested in the soon coming of Jesus. And, um, you know, we've been here since 2020, I think, 2000 and. Uh, yeah, I think it's 2020. I can't believe that it's been that long. Um, and uh, we've been sharing about a number of different things that have to do with current events that have to do with certain issues that that maybe people don't talk about as much. And one thing that I think that uh, is really interesting that we're going to talk about today is this whole matter of the history of Protestantism. And um, kind of an interesting take on that today uh, with Max Sukert. Max is here from, where are you coming from, Max? So I'm, I'm right now in the Waldensian Valleys of Northern Italy, near to the town of Torre Pellice. Okay, so we are going to learn about the Waldensians. We're going to learn about their con contribution to the great controversy. And we're going to learn about what Max's uh, ministry is doing in the Waldensian Valley. And uh, it's exciting to find out about this as well. So before we start, Brother Max, would you start us off with a word of prayer? Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to pray that you would bless now our time together, our discussion and sharing. And Father, I pray that it would be a blessing for us as we look to the past um, and see how you've worked already and, and the principles that you used in the past and to see that it's always been actually the same and um, that you have also for us a future and that as you've been with your people of old, we know that you'll be with us today. And we pray that you bless now our time, that each and everyone that's listening, that it would be that there would be a message for each one from your throne, not our own words, but through your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Max. Okay, so Brother Max, this is my first time meeting you, and uh, I learned of you from uh, a friend of ours. Um, he is also involved in agriculture. Is that how you know him, Brother Darren Greenfeld? Yes, we met at the Adventist European Agricultural Conference in November. They had it here in Italy, and I was there. And then, um, yeah, he also came and visited the Waldensian Valleys here, and I showed him all the historical sites, gave him a tour. So. That is so neat. That is so neat. Well, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you brought up in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Yeah, so I was, I had the huge privilege, like my miracle story is that I was, I did grow up in the Adventist church to both, to parents that were both in the church and who chose to, who loved me, who really chose to also homeschool us children, mm -hmm. um, which was a huge blessing. Growing up, we grew up in the countryside, we had homeschool, my parents, you know, we, they, we brought us to church, they taught us, we, we, we memorized scripture, all of these things where you say, looking back, I mm -hmm. see that was a miracle that that happened. So I never had like this like conversion where like everything was flipped on its head, you know, but um, I really see that this was such a miracle and something that's so seldom actually in our world. Yes. What, yes. God, what God did on my parents' hearts to prepare for us children was a miracle. Um, mm -hmm. So I had that huge blessing. I was homeschooled actually all the way through 12th grade. So I didn't, I went to, to preschool and kindergarten, but from first grade, my, my mother said, oh, no, we're going to stay at home and That's homeschooled true. all three of us kids um, in Vermont. Can I ask you something um, on yeah. this subject? And I'm sorry, I'm going to try to stay back here because the light is such, um, but um, would you say that growing up as homeschool, because there are people who go through homeschool and everything and still, uh, you know, have have questions about what they believe do you think it's because your parents were able to teach you how, about the love of Jesus you know I they were able to so. show you in a very real way yeah I think so because I, I never felt unloved I never I had parents that really loved me like so I never had questions and, and I always just I never doubted that God loved me to be honest mm -hmm. like I never okay. it was never even a question in my mind just because it was 
lived in my family and my parents are not perfect you know I, I know mm -hmm. I know that as well but there was that love there and it was because it was based on the bible and God also put other people in my path in my church yeah. or, or later on that were also helping mentoring along the way who you know mm -hmm. so not just that but really from my parents the fact mm -hmm. that they showed love towards each other and to us was mm -hmm. a huge thing I think and um I, did you have questions about what the Seventh-day Adventist Church had to say? Did you ever question, like, is this is this right? Or did you go through that experience? To be honest, not super strongly. I mean, there were certain things, but for me, it made sense. And, like, we went through the things, like, together. Like, we had their pastor, and he came, and he gave us children Bible studies. We went through all the Bible study guides, all this stuff. And it just, it was clear. It made, it made sense. sense. So yeah. to be honest, I never had that, like, where is it really, I've had questions like, God, where are you? Are you going to, you know, what am I going to do now? Those type of things. But like the faith things, I've yeah. never questioned it too much. Not, not that I haven't questioned it, but like I've tested it and see mm -hmm. and search and compare with other things, but nothing that caused me to doubt it. And there are some people who think that for you to have this deep relationship with Jesus, you have to have gone on that, you know, faith testing experience. Have you been on your own faith testing experience where you where still, even though you haven't left the faith and that kind of thing, where you just your your faith goes deeper and deeper? Yeah, for sure. And I, I think um, even just the past couple of years, even more so with our family, with having a son, with where we've moved to two different countries and lived in, I mean, me and my wife, since we've gotten married, we've lived in like, we've been married six years and we moved, we've lived in seven different places, you know, for, for, so it's been a bit, and there's been some challenges and some things along the way. So that's been yeah. challenging ever since coming to Europe, actually, there's been, you know, different faith challenges, some even a crisis where I went through with my own faith in a way, but just kind of questioning, where do I go next? What do I do? Yes. And having to like wait on God and have patience yes. and have him change certain things in my own mind, basically. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Cause I just want to clarify with people. Cause uh, I think it, you're right. It is a rare thing for someone to be brought up in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Sadly, it's a rare thing to be brought up in the Seventh-day Adventist church and not to have a crisis where you think I want to, you know, I want to leave, or you've made some decisions that, that you regret greatly and this kind of thing. And so, uh, I praise the Lord for that testimony. And I think that that's going to bring a lot of encouragement and hope for a lot of people. But well, I think that that's, for, for young people, I just see that uh, there's no, nothing in the world that's worth it. Like I've seen what my friends have done. I've seen what other people have done. I've heard enough of the testimonies of people who come from the world say, what is there? There's nothing there. It's Amen. empty. Praise so for me, though, I mean, yes. praise God. I only say praise God that I grew up this way because it's yes. as, as I the older I get, the more I realize that's not normal. It is a privilege. Um, And that's why I say it's a miracle. My testimony is not it's not because of what I did, you know, I didn't choose, oh, I'm going to be born in this family, in this place and live in the country. Yes. I didn't have that choice, right? Yes. But now I have to use that to share with other people. Praise God. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, if you could just share with us a little bit about then, you know, in your adult life, what you've been doing and um, how it is that you started doing what you're doing. So at 18, I went to Europe, to Germany. For, for four months for AFCO Europe. So Amazing okay. Facts Center of Evangelism. It's under Doug Bachelor's ministry, Amazing Facts, more or less, that is connected with the ministry there. So, so you wanted to go to Europe, but you thought, I'll do it with Amazing Facts. And yeah, well, for me, it was, I was planning to go to a mission school in the US, and that one closed right before I was going to go. Oh. So I was like, okay, where do I go now, God? And everything lined up for the one in Europe, because I was looking for all the different options and the time slot and everything fit better with the one in Europe. Mm -hmm. And for me to go to AFCO in California or to go to Germany from Vermont, it's like eight hours or six hours. So either way you have to fly. And it's like, why not go to Germany for, yeah. for yeah. Right? And so. And they had classes in English. Yeah. The course was in English because it's for all of the different European 
oh, to go to, or even other people from outside of Europe to go to. Very cool. um, and I, I went for four months and now I've been for 10 years in Europe. Uh, <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> well, yeah, God, God had different plans mm -hmm. for me. Um, so then I, I went through the four month course and then afterwards they asked if I would stay on and volunteer with the, with the school for one year, one year turned into to three years. Um, and that was working in, in Germany. The school then moved to Portugal. So I was in Portugal with the mission school there. In the meantime, I met my wife who's German. Um, and then after the three years, I said, well, I want to get married. I had the, I, I wanted to, to marry my wife, my now wife, Anna. And but I wanted to also then have something to to as a trade or something to fall on back on as well, because, yeah, just being missionary, you can do that. It's possible. But I wanted to have some sort of thing. And it was also it's always good to learn parents. a trade. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I actually I got married and then went to university. So I, I did it a little bit backwards. Yes. But um, family was supportive of, of helping to with that and everything. So um i then went to study in germany um in university and I had in to german, learn german or in english in german in german i had to learn german to study but then i had to pay only like 300 400 dollars a semester wow. for university so the idea was okay well student loans in the u.s which are hard or yeah. learn german which is hard so just yeah learn hard. german learn german so I learned German, God helped me a lot with that. Yeah. And then I studied and I tried, I, my thing was to do a lot of, I tried a lot of different things that I wanted to apply for. And I was like, okay, God, what do you want me to do? Because I, I know I want to do evangelism, but what can I put with the evangelism? And so I was like, okay, maybe I can do um, a paramedic or a physical therapist or carpenter or something. Like I sent out applications to so many places. And it didn't really work. You made um, applications for what places? So like, either for universities or also to do oh, apprenticeships. Oh, okay. Or okay. for like with a carpenter to learn. And for some reason or another, everything didn't work. None of that them. That must have been discouraging a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Because <laughs> either either it didn't work because Sabbath was a problem, oh, okay. or or it was some other problems like with physical physical therapist you needed to get undressed with other sex or things oh. like that or university you know because you get a massage and everything okay. or other ministry no other universities they didn't know what to do with me because I was homeschooled so I didn't have a even though I did my SAT and everything in the U.S. in Germany like no you need a certificate from the state that you finished your schooling and whatever because yeah. homeschooling is not allowed in Germany so actually i think that there was a family that had their child taken away from them in germany because of yeah. the homeschooling issue yeah there's lots of stories of things like that it's That's so yeah so anyways they didn't know what to do with me but this small technical university somehow i went with my wife there she had an, she was finishing her studies and we went there and it got opened that this little technical college said well you'll have to just see if he can do it basically you have to see if he can if he can pass everything. He's homeschooled. Okay, we'll try him anyways. Oh, good. So, so I said, okay. That was a horticulture school. Yeah. So that's a great degree to have horticulture. I, I also at first I was like, okay, this is something. It was not anything in my plans to do something like that. Um, but I really loved the studies. It was a really nice study. And then shortly after starting it, you know, I started in 2018. And, and then, of course, at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, you also realize how important agriculture, horticulture is with the COVID pandemic. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's basically so, it. Horticulture, yeah. is that different than like an agriculture degree? Well, horticulture is basically specifically on um, like you take away that it's not focused on the animals. So like with agriculture, usually it's like animals, big fields of grains, grain, horticulture is more like fruits, vegetables, ornamental plants. Oh my God, like, that's the most, that's the best degree that you could have, I would think. Yes. I would love to do so it was, that was, it was very blessed. Um, it was challenge in German, everything, but uh, it was also a blessing. And in the meantime, also in all of the studies, we had our first, our son, our first, our only mm -hmm. son, now Joel. 
mm-hmm. um, who was born. And then of course COVID hits. And then it's we were where we were living then, it was we were we were using an apartment in my wife's uh, my wife's parents' home. It and was in a city not, somewhere. It was not in a big city, but it was in a larger town. And then COVID hits and we're like, okay, God, what am I gonna do? Um, I have a son now, we're in a big town. I'm a, I'm a student only. What's gonna happen? Where are we gonna go? You did finish your horticulture though, right? I did. I finished it. Um, but I I was still in the process. I was not yet finishing it yet. During COVID. Time. It was like, okay, what are we going to do? And so we were really praying. I don't remember praying for anything so much like this in my life because it was not just me now. It was my son also. And what are we going to do? Um, and God, and that was the perfect time to pray also because our son was just a baby and you're awake around the clock. So at, at two o'clock, you pray at four o'clock at six o'clock, you know, every time you pray when you're awake in the middle of the night, fasting and praying and Amen. God opened up the way for us to go to um, a ministry in France, frontline messenger, where I still work for. And Amen. so I was finishing my studies. So it took a from the time we had the confirmation to go to this ministry until we actually went was almost a year. Um, and I was finishing up my studies mostly. The last little bit I was able to finish from a distance. COVID made everything also easier in that re- regard. Yeah. So, and we was okay, God, we're going to go to France. And um, the idea in France is also, okay, you can homeschool in France. So long-term, that was also a, a thing for us with our son. Because Germany, we knew in the future, it's not possible. Long-term, we won't stay there because we mm-hmm. wanted to homeschool. So he said, we go to France, we can work with ministry work. Um, there was the possibility to start doing some agriculture in connection with the ministry. We tried to do some things and also to do some small missionary training schools. So that's how we got involved with Frontline Messenger. And yeah, Frontline Messenger um, is a small ministry under ASI, So, but ASI France, ASI Europe. Um, and it was started in 2014. Also an interesting story, uh, Alex, the, the guy who runs the ministry, maybe you can he can share his testimony sometime, but um a crazy testimony also but he came from the world totally different background from me with uh demon stuff and all that crazy stuff you know coming from that um and god called him to go to southeast asia Mm -hmm. um and he went there to vietnam cambodia and Laos, and sharing first he went he didn't know what he was going to do god said just you go he bought his ticket without knowing what he was going to do and went there just he was had such the impression to go there. And the first thing he did was going through all the, the, the country and seeing what the need was. That's what the, the church leaders there told him to do. And he saw, okay, well, most of the Adventist members, baptized members, don't have a Bible in their language. And it's so expensive. Um, and so he got funds and it started with, okay, we got to organize, get our own association and everything. Um, going to every church throughout these three countries and give making sure that every Adventist member had a Bible. Mm. That was the, that was how it started. And from there, it, it grew to employing some local missionaries, helping to train them, started a small vegan restaurant in Cambodia. Mm-hmm. It was very well, worked very well. It was mostly for uh, tourists and that helped to fund, fund the business there. And they had a, a YouTube channel also in Khmer, the language of Cambodia and, and sharing and, and things like that with, with many, many people, like thousands of views on the videos. And is that still happening right now? A little bit. COVID, the thing is, is we had some other people then that came and then it left and it kind of COVID also made everything a bit difficult. Mm-hmm. We're trying with some things to start again there in Cambodia, mm-hmm. but most of it is not, not, not going on right now mm-hmm. at the moment, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, Alex, he, he had this, everything that was going there but then god called him and really pushed him to come back to france mm-hmm. and to do to start his own business and to do entrepreneurial like business work mm-hmm. not because he really wanted to but because he really saw that's what god wanted him to do because it was not they were not getting the funds necessary for also for um doing the mission mm-hmm. and to do as much as they wanted to do and to do more and to support more missionaries and so he came back to France and started doing different businesses to support mm-hmm. the mission. And he's, he's not, he's not an old, he's like in his, yeah, he's in his early thirties. Um, he's not old. <laughs> he's not old, but he said he started, okay. Like he started 
making different businesses to actually then support the missionaries to support so that right now our ministry is mostly self-supporting like for our running costs and everything basically everything is covered from the businesses there are some people that give some donations but i say probably 75 to 80 percent is self-sustaining praise the lord um, praise yeah the praise lord. god for that because uh, it's not it's not a given that can work um yeah and so in all of that we come to France. We're doing that. I'm helping with the a lot with the evangelistic side of things. We started a small farm, which kind of failed. But um, why anyways, did it fail? We had uh, we were we we borrowed a piece of land from someone. It was not very good land. We didn't mm. have a good. There was the competition, the market. It was a very bad year that we started. It was very yeah. rainy. Lots of different. We didn't have a high enough budget for the startup costs. Anyways, multiple reasons. It Well, I'm sure you learned a lot from it. I did. I did. You learned a lot from failing. Yeah. Um, but it was it was a good experience. Yes. Um, but then also in all of this, um, so a year and a half ago, well, almost two years ago, we, we got, they, they, we found out, we applied for homeschooling in France. They mm -hmm. changed some rules recently, right when we moved, mm -hmm. that instead of now, um, just declaring that you would homeschool you needed to now ask for permission Ooh. and so we and you have to meet specific criteria mm. um, and so we applied for homeschooling and we were denied homeschooling in france wow and in france you need to have mandatory education from age three and our son age was three. three yeah wow which is crazy. In Germany, it's six, but in France, it was three. And they rejected it. We applied again. And our son would have needed to attend school that September. And anyways, we met all the criteria we thought we needed. But the, the local authorities said, no, this doesn't meet. And da, da, da. If you want, you can go before the court and everything. But anyways, even while you're going to the court, the child needs to be in school. Yeah. And, and we had already, since we got the first letter and we knew from some other experiences, we thought we already knew that it, pro we continued the process, but we knew, okay, maybe we're going to need to move. Mm. And we had already had the idea to come to the Waldensian Valleys in, in the next years or couple of years as a ministry to start something here in Italy, in the Waldensian Valleys. But this kind of sped up the process a bit because when we got the second letter, we were like, well, we're already going basically so the waldensian valley though that's not in france where is the waldensian it's, valley? It, it's in italy it's in italy oh, so it's in italy that's why we, we we moved um september of 2022 we moved um to italy oh i thought these mountain ranges they covered france yes it's, it's we're very close to france actually just over the mountains you're in france okay so but where we were in France was a bit further north. Um, okay. And Italy is less restrictive on these types of things. Yeah, homeschooling is allowed. Uh, we know other Adventist families that homeschooled here. Um, and again, also from six, you don't have to do anything. So until six, we have time. Okay, we can learn Italian. Our son can learn Italian. We can do the tests we need to do or whatever. So, so now you're going to have to learn Italian in addition to the German. Yes, we've already been working on that. And, and uh you so frontline messenger when you started with them they had been thinking about uh doing a ministry in the waldensian valley at that point yes because we did some short-term training and we brought the students to the waldensian valleys for like a week and showed them also also in southern france to the albigensians another um older christian group that were very faithful and and like kind of learned about the huguenots and these different different church groups and the idea was well why don't we do something here in the Italian Alps in the Waldensian Valleys also as a mission for the people here, because the Walden there are still Waldensian people here in the valleys. Um, also for a lot of tourists that come through here. Even oh, other so it would be a, it would be a school that tourists could visit as well. Well, a, a place that tourists come by and that can be for mission. Um, for example, you have lots of groups that come here. You have lots of Adventists that come, so that's. Yeah. Um, but you have lots of other um, evangelical groups, Protestant groups that come here 
yeah. because they've heard the history of the Waldensians. Right. So, so what what role would your school have in you know reaching just, tourists? Well, we want to have not just the school, but also right next to the school, we want to have a small museum on liberty of conscience. Mm. So that also that because and where the school will be is mm -hmm. like a stone's throw away from where the Waldensians had their missionary school, which is a museum now. Wow. So the idea, so the idea is to, to train people where the Waldensians were trained and also where we are just, just being here. Even before we even start anything, we live here. All the different people that come through here, we share with them the great controversy. Wait, wait, wait. How do you know all the people who are coming through there? Because where we live, Everybody has to walk. By. God, God, this is providence because God gave us a house to rent that's also very close to where this Waldensian school is, which is now a museum. So you guys purchase property to do this school on? We're purchasing property, a couple other houses that are where I'm living now, we rent a little house. Mm -hmm. But a few houses further up a little up up the hill, I don't know, like 300, 400 feet. Mm -hmm. we're purchasing we're going to purchase two little buildings there um where we'll have the school and the museum it's they're small it's going to be a, a small school a small a small buildings but where we rent everybody has to also walk by our house if they want to get to the waldensian valley well if they want to know if they want to get to the either the church there's a waldensian church here an old waldensian church mm -hmm. or to the waldensian school they oh. park and they have to walk by our house like there's a path that goes by our house like a little road Dirt road. Ma Max, I'm going to the Waldensian to take a tour in the end of August. So I'll know better what you're talking okay. about. Then. Yes, and you'll, have to, you'll, you'll see. I'll probably you'll, see you. I'll, I'm going yes. <laughs> to reach yes. out to you before I go there. Yes. But yeah, maybe what you can do is you could um, share it with people because there might be people who are watching this who've never heard of the Waldensians. And so I'm just assuming people know who the Waldensians are, but why don't you uh, share with people? Yeah, so the Waldensians are people basically who, I would say if you've, if you've studied Revelation chapter 12, where it speaks about the church in the wilderness, they were a part of the church in the wilderness during this 1,260 years of papal supremacy. These were people who held the torch up. They kept the faith alive during the time when most of Europe, most was in darkness. They had they had the Bible in their language hundreds of years before Luther, before Huss, before Wycliffe. And um, how is that Bible, that Bible that the Waldensians had? Like what what how good is that translation? It was not perfect because they had they had some translations from Jerome's Vulgate. So it was translations from the Vulgate, many, many of them. Um, at least at a certain age, maybe before that they had otherwise, but in general, there was it was a, a good translation for the time. It would be like Wycliffe's translation later. It was not perfect, but it was enough that they had it was in the language of the people. Because otherwise, nobody <laughs> Latin used to be the language of the people, but eventually it became other languages. And so they put it then into the language of the people. And that's what gave them mm -hmm. their power when they went throughout so Europe. Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, verse six, um, that's the verse that you're talking about where this woman, which a woman represents a church, fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So that's 1,260 days. And we know that in prophetic time, a day equals a year. So 1,260 years of um, time where the church was under quite a bit of um, tribulation, persecution, and this kind of thing. And the Waldensians, um, they were a special people group in that time. What was so significant about the Waldensians? Maybe you could explain that. Well, first off is I think that they were Adventists. <laughs> I mean, they had beliefs very similar to us. They baptized by immersion. Um, in a time when you know a sprinkling became the the norm in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. they held the Bible as their only rule of faith. They they believed I, I believe that they had a, a, a probably an understanding of the state of the dead similar like us. They kept many of them kept the Sabbath the seventh day Sabbath. Um, we don't know if all of them did, but at least there is some that did. The thing is, there's a problem that 
um, a lot of most of their writings were destroyed by the Inquisition, like cartloads of it destroyed and everything was written out by hand. So a, a lot of information we have comes from the Inquisitors themselves who write their reports about the Waldensians or from their later history or from oral tradition or whatever. But even from that, we see that they, they kept the Sabbath. They kept the true faith. Um, so theirs was, it was a really a biblical faith. They were further along mm -hmm. than the reformers actually in, in many ways. So um, uh, what time period did they occupy in history? And how, so, how did they end up in the Waldensian Valley? Yeah, that's a good question. So basically what's interesting is a history that not many people know is up until even the 800s, 900s, Northern Italy, so around Milan and Turin, so it's the areas of Piedmont and Lombardy, these areas were not under the control of Rome. They were mm -hmm. a separate diocese, a separate church, a separate, they were like their own, and you had other places in Europe like that too. Um, and so you had a more or less a purer faith in Northern Italy. But over time, Rome through political, through armies, through whatever, takes over Northern Italy. And those Christians who are not willing to compromise are either either left to foreign lands or they went up into the valleys of the Alps. Mm -hmm. And that's where the Waldensians come. So they're pushed up in the 800s, 900s, 1000, 1100. But their faith goes back further. You know, maybe they're called Waldensians only when you get to the 11th century, 12th century. But before that, their faith goes back much further. And the name Waldensian just means people of the valleys. So they were called the people of the valleys because they lived up in these isolated valleys, hard to reach areas um, in the wilderness, right? This was, this was, and it, which you read in Revelation 12, also in verse 14, um, and the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Mm -hmm. So this is where she flees up into the wilderness. And God gave them the nourishment of food and water and such while they were here up mm -hmm. in these valleys. Wow. What is life like there in the Waldensian Valley? Is it is it hard being up there? Is, are weather conditions harsh? Is it easy to grow things? Um. It's it's easier now than like centuries ago. Centuries ago, like you would have on the tops of the mountains, they would have a lot more snow. And so you would have a lot more snow even in the valleys. Now it's become more mild. So like where we live, it's very sunny. We'll, we'll get snow. We're at about a thousand meters. So 3000 feet above sea level where we live, where the Waldensian school was in a place called Prada del Torno. Um, and here we, we, we will get snow. But it's still, it's warmer like than from Vermont where I grew up. So you still have a lot of sun. The summers are still very hot and the winters are mild. It, it'll get down a little bit below freezing, but, you know, down into the 20s. Not, and, not, not a lot colder. And the Waldensians, like over that period of hundreds of years, they were persecuted at various times. Uh, my, I didn't realize that there were, uh, descendants of the Waldensians, people who had survived. I thought they were pretty much all wiped out. What, so can you share a little bit about that? Like, uh, yeah. you know, at what point, you know, did they, you know, how, at what point did, did their people group get so small that, that, you know, their whole heritage made might have been, um, you know, threatened. Well, it used to be that you would have, I mean, actually you had Waldensians in all over Europe, hmm. first off. Like it was not just here. You had them on the French side of the Alps. You had them in, they, they sent their missionaries to every country in Europe, underground missionaries. You had communities of underground Christians throughout the whole continent. And, and that's something I think that we should share about because those missionaries were probably, a lot of them were young people. Yes. The, probably a lot of them, like when they were sent off to college, my understanding is that they had been training all throughout their homeschooling life to go to college to be a missionary. Exactly. And every one of their children memorized scripture. And this is why they had such power also in their missionary work was because they memorized huge portions of scripture. Wow. So like 
you would have, for instance, even with your small children, you would start and you would say, okay, like this one, this child memorizes the book of Matthew, this one, Mark, this one, Luke, this one, John, like the book of the, the whole book, right? Mm -hmm. And then between your children and in your family, at minimum, you can put together the New Testament, right? Wow. And many of the, there's even one historian, he said that it was difficult to find a Catholic priest who knew three chapters of the Bible from memory in a row. And even our women who are cooking at the cooking stove know the whole New Testament. And wow. so you can That's imagine- That's such a rebuke for, for, for me and for many other people. For me too. People. And actually we've started to start memorizing um, scripture since moving here actually. Mm -hmm. Because we said we've got to start somewhere. And this is, and I think this is an appeal if, if people don't continue learning, listening further, but to start, if you stop here and you, the only thing you take away from this is just start have someone to be accountable with. Mm. And there was even, there's a, um, in one of the, uh, there's a book from, um, oh, what's his name? A.T. Jones. And he has some history also. And he mentions a little bit about the Waldensians in one of his books. He says, there's like a Waldensian challenge that one Waldensian says, oh, it's so difficult to memorize. And they said, just start with one verse a day. And at the end of a year, you have 300. And... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the idea is like wherever you start, even if you do like one verse a week, but if you continue to keep it up and review it at the mm. end of the year, at least 50 verses. Yeah. You have 50 yeah. weapons to fight against at the enemy. Yeah. You have 50 things to help. And so we've just started like, okay, we have a little box and we're going through them every day at, at, at breakfast, for example. Yeah. Your your child is going to surpass you, I'm sure. Yes, I believe so. <laughs> he already <laughs> is correcting me when he, he doesn't, he can't read, right? He's four. He can't read, but he says the whole Bible verse, long Bible verses from memory yeah. faster Lord. than I've got it. Yes, um, I hope that continues. Yeah. And so like, this is something that an appeal for anyone who is watching, like just start with something. Like if you have 10 Bible verses you memorize in a year, but yes. start, you know, and yes. as you do it, it gets easier. Yeah. So, Amen. so, um, so you, your ministry, so was it Alex? somebody decided that this was something this valley was a place that you wanted to do ministry and that you wanted to start um an evangelism training center yeah so yeah, yeah that was the idea we wanted to do have something here where we could train people and train them also how they can be self-sustainable missionaries like how they can combine business and mission yeah um and the first step was i mean it was sped up but it was also us coming here to have some feet on the ground to get to know the area to look because you can look at houses and things better when you're here yes. start to learn the language so we've been here a year and a half me and my family just getting everything getting into the the, the, the routine of things figuring out the bureaucracy and and such mm. um, and now we're, we have we've we've raised funds where we have mostly reached our goal for mm -hmm. purchasing the two buildings okay. and then renov and we have to renovate them and, and, and some such, some things. So we're in the process. Bureaucracy is kind of slow, but. Uh, well, we if somebody wanted to help uh, donate and uh, help with the project, where would they reach out? What is the website? So if, if you look at frontline messenger training.com um, and I can put something up at the end for that, but frontline messenger training.com. We also have a GoFundMe page or through PayPal or um, it's possible okay. to donate. So that. Is, is that frontline messenger training? Is that something that they could give in the United States tax deductible, that kind of thing, or is it a European um, organization? It's a European organization at the moment. We, um, we were in the process. We're in the process. We, we, we've tried to have it in the U S um, have the nonprofit status. At the moment, we need we we got it, and then we need to renew it. It's it's a bit, um, okay. but right okay. now it's it's only in Europe. But we need we we have the possibility to continue it in the U.S. Okay. Um, well, this is all good to know, and maybe you could share a little bit about what is it like there in the Waldensian Valley. What are those Waldensian descendants, you know, like? Um, I think you shared that they have their own church still. They. Yes. So the Waldensian Church. As a, as a people, so the descendants of these people who lived here over centuries still live here. You still have like, in in the valleys here, you have like three valleys. You have about 15,000 Waldensians that are still here. 
and in all of Italy of about 30,000. And then you have about 30,000 descendants of those people who also live in South America, in Uruguay and Argentina. Whoa. And also have an organized Waldensian church. Um, so those are the only places you really have organized Waldensian as a denomination. Is it because it's a closely knit group of people? Like, is it, do they have certain beliefs that are peculiar to them still? But it's, it's I think it's because they're also, they're Protestants surrounded by Catholics. So like- so they, they um, You said they were before the reformers, they considered yes. themselves still to be part of the Catholic church, right? Not, not they, they, they believe themselves to be Catholic in this uh, idea of universal, but not part of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. okay. They were a separate, they're not really, now they would consider themselves Protestant. Okay. But they never really came out of Rome. Mm -hmm. They were before, like, and it's interesting. One historian, he puts it, Wiley, who Ellen White quotes in The Great Controversy, Chapter 4, about the Waldensians. If you, ha if you haven't read the book, read at least Chapter 4 history the, about the Waldensians and this guy Wiley he writes about in his book about how um there was one reason why the papacy wanted to so much persecute these people was because their claim of also being of apostolic origin so you have the the Catholics saying we come from Peter and you have the Waldensians saying we also we come from the apostolic times and both can't be right if the Waldensians are old, Rome is new, he says. If they are pure, then Rome is impure. So, of mm. course, Rome wants to get rid of the church in the wilderness because the church in the wilderness traces themselves also back to the apostolic times. And both of them can't be right because they're definitely not going in the same direction. So, and so and how, mm -hmm, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no. Well, I was, you, you were going to say, I don't want to interrupt you. And so, no, I was just going to say, that's why the people here they were they they were always surrounded by catholics they were always and that kept them as their knit community so until... so there are catholics in the waldensian valley right now there are a few yes now now it's it's not there's no animosity between them basically right now. but so but, would you say that in the waldensian valley right now it's more of the waldensians or more catholics it's still more of the waldensians than catholic and what are some of the belief systems now that are peculiar to Waldensians? Because they don't keep Sabbath anymore. Unfortunately, no, I wonder when that happened, that they quit keeping the Sabbath. Well, it's not written explicitly, but kind of between the lines that when they joined the Protestant reformers from Geneva in 1532, um, at a, they, they met together with um, Farrell, who also is written about in the, the Great Controversy, um, who was working with Calvin and some others, they came to these valleys and they met together and they joined the Protestant Reformation. And they should have, the Waldensians should have been an influence upon these other groups, but instead they were influenced. And instead of training their young people, continuing to train their missionaries here in Prado del Torno in the missionary school, they sent their young people to Geneva, to oh. the Calvinist seminaries. To learn from John Calvin. Of course, John Calvin didn't have any place for the Sabbath. Um, John John Calvin baptized infants, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that started a change in the theology. Um, wow. So then their, their young people went off to the seminaries, learned Calvinist uh, teachings, and then came back to uh, the Waldensian Valley. And exactly. They so, so believed. Mm -hmm, go ahead. No, finish, finish. Th that's so interesting because, you know, I think one of the major reasons why we are having the issues that we have within the Adventist church is because, um, you know, this whole issue with accreditation, right? And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I know that when accreditation came into the Adventist schools, there was a lot of debate and there was a lot of heart ache about this subject because many of our people believe that accreditation was not something that we should pursue because it would cause us to teach rather than teaching for the sake of um, the salvation and um, you know the conversion of the individual that true education 
we would be teaching according to state and government standards. And um, I feel like we as a people, we have gotten to this point where we idolize this worldly view of what education is about. And we we put intellectualism, uh, you know, science, what is considered to be top level science, we put that on a pedestal. And I'm thinking this probably happened for the Waldensians when they when they all of a sudden they went from being a people group that were persecuted, they were a small people group, and now they're joining with the Protestants and they're like, oh, we're going to be part of that, that, you know, the general body of Christ now. And it's going to be so neat to be with all these people who are of the world and they accept us now. And now we can go to their schools and we're going to go to their seminaries, which many of our people are doing. They're going to worldly seminaries and they're instead of you know our pastors learning seventh-day adventist things they're coming back and saying we've gone to like fuller and we've gone to all these other places i just mentioned fuller because it seems like so many adventist pastors are going to fuller and when they come back there's not that much ellen white there's not that much spirit of prophecy um it's like a much it's an emphasis on worship style and and uh, this um, social gospel and that kind of thing. And so uh, it really changes then the culture of the church. It changes the belief system of the church. And I know that I'm, I'm talking a lot, but it just, um, you know, when you say that, it's just like, we have to let people know because everyone's like, why is it that we're having these issues in the church as far as belief systems and that kind of thing? Well, and that was the same thing with the Waldensians. It was it was a bit of they were they had been alone, imagine, for hundreds of years, right? And they're the peculiar, strange people surrounded by Catholics. And finally, there's someone a bit like you, right? So it's easy to be hard on them, but it's also to realize persecution, persecution, persecution. Finally, someone comes who's like speaking your same language and who's like We like has, you. And, and there's some change, some there's some differences, but you say like that's something close and you compromise for the sake of unity with someone. Yeah. And I see that's what we're doing now. Also, you mentioned all the educational stuff, but here in Europe or even in the U S the ecumenical movement of such, where you have in some churches, Adventist pastors going to the non-Adventist churches and non-Adventist pastors coming and preaching in Adventist Adventist churches. Yeah. Because, Oh, we're all the same. We all, you know, we all love Jesus, this and that, but, there's a special message that we have. And the mm -hmm. Waldensians, unfortunately, they laid down the torch in many ways. And, and I don't, it wasn't a, there was a majority, but I believe when you look at this up, there was at least a sizable minority who didn't go along with it. Yeah. Their story is not written. It's not there. I don't, I don't, I don't see any of the story. They were, they were dissenters, like there always are. So Small there was minority. a story. And God, there were other people who picked up the torch, like the Anabaptists and, and others who continued around the same time. So God always has a people. Um, but unfortunately, these people, for instance, now the Waldensian church is fallen Babylon. I say that not like just like any of the other denominations mm -hmm. where, you know, they sprinkle baptism. They don't keep the Sabbath. Of, of course, there's no space for the sanctuary, heavenly sanctuary. There's um, but they also accept homosexual marriage and bless it. Um, and they're in, deeply in ecumenicism and are proud about that. Yes. Uh, and they're lovely people. They're they're yes. very nice, kind people. Like and there's a difference in these valleys compared to other valleys that are only with Catholics. Like even non yes. non-Christian people who've come by here said, I came to this valley and it's just different here. The yeah. spirit is different. The people are different. It's it's somehow different. So there's still a difference based on, you know, the history there. Yes, yes. But yes. unfortunately, they're not going the direction they should. Or and should so they... this is such a beautiful thing that you're going to have a school there in the Waldensian Valley. And the descendants of this such a special people group that you'll have an opportunity to minister to them and you know and it you know what you're saying about there being a a difference in that valley um that is that's so special i think any time that that god 
has been able to show his character to people. You know, it truth, that's a revelation of the character of God. And so Protestantism, it's just a deeper revelation of the character of God. You hopefully, if people know Jesus better, you will see it reflected in their character and their love and, and the peace and that kind of thing. And so what a, that's a beautiful testimony for them. Should I show you a, a couple pictures maybe? Would uh, love uh, let me see. I need to share my screen, I think, right? Here. Can you see it? Yes. The screen? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so yeah, here if you see the name Frontline Messenger Training, um, and our goal with the training will be to be to help create modern tent makers, people that actually can support themselves financially and not to be dependent upon donations and use business as a tool for mission. And this is what the Waldensians did, is their business when they went out as merchant men or when they went to university or whatever they did, the end goal was mission. They weren't I am such a believer of that. I'm we're totally on the same page. Yes, because because like it, it's not like oh let's do business and then do a little mission on the side. Like yeah. their business was an entering wedge for mission. Yes. And um, here there's some pictures and there's also this is interesting because your your channel is Med Missionary, right? And yes. I thought it would be interesting for you to see what um, a little bit from the history that the Waldensians were medical missionaries. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not a surprise, right? God always has the same principles in his people. But um, here's from Leroy Froome from Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers. I know some people, you know, Froome is, is a controversial name. But anyways, yes. the history here is interesting. Um, Moreland throws an illus illuminating word on the combining of medical and missionary work. And it says here in quotes, moreover, the greatest part of them, these are the, speaking about the Waldensian missionaries, gave themselves to the study and practice of physic and surgery. Mm. And herein they excelled, wow. thereby rendering themselves most able and skillful physicians of soul and body. That's so amazing. They, so this is what they were doing. They were, they were trained in surgery, right? I mean, this is, I mean, that's another level of medical missionary work, but yes. interesting. And then here, another quote. Each one of the barbs. Now, the Waldensian pastors were called barbs, which in their language, the Occitan language um, that they spoke in the past, um, the language that barb meant uncle. Because the Bible says, call, call no man father. So they called them uncle as a term of <laughs> respect. That's interesting. Yeah. And um, in their respect as a pastor. Um, so it says each one of these barbs, each one of these pastors or missionaries, besides the knowledge and practice of the ministry, had the knowledge of some trade and especially medicine and surgery for which they were skillful and well considered and practiced the, to charitably assist their needy brethren, as well as to cover them and help them for their expenses of their long and dangerous journeys. Hmm. So medical missionary work was also a way that they used to pay their bills for their travel expenses, right? This, as they were going right. around, as they would go and because everybody needed help in the Middle Ages, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then one other quote about this. Here also is a beautiful spot in the Waldensian Valley. So it's really a beautiful area here that God mm -hmm. had um, this place. But this quote was really special because I really liked it. Um, they had much experience in medicine and surgery. And in these arts possessed amazing secrets, wonderful in their simplicity. Mm. And I think of like our, what we have in Spirit of Prophecy from Ellen White, amazing secrets that are wonderful in their simplicity, like charcoal, right? There's all these things, mm. like whatever other things, you know, just these little gems in Spirit of Prophecy, so simple and yet so mm -hmm. powerful. Yes. And I wonder how similar they were also in the times of the Waldensians. Mm. Um. Now, and this is now this is prophetic looking forward and something that's very interesting for us. Ellen White has some other quotes about this, um, about the Waldensians, because she well, Ellen White visited three times the valleys here and had mm -hmm. a burden for these people. She preached here in these valleys and mm. in these valleys was the first Adventist baptized in Europe was in the Waldensian really? valleys. Yes. It was, was it a Waldensian uh, descendant? Yes. Wow. The, the first 
two people that were baptized were here in that were Waldensian origin in these valleys. And so is, the, is the church here. is the church doing pretty well there in the Waldensian Valley? Unfortunately, not. It's small. Mm -hmm. There's about between fifteen to twenty members, okay. and it's. Yeah, it has some problems. We don't need, oh, I, I okay. go into details with it, but um, yeah. and none of the members are of Waldensian. One of only one is of Waldensian origin. Okay. Um, but the church never really made a lot of headway with the Waldensian people after that. Mm -hmm. And Ellen White even writes about how it goes forward so slowly. Um, and actually, if you want to read about this, you mm -hmm. read the history in historical sketches of Seventh Day Adventist missions. It's a book mm -hmm. by Ellen White about her travels in Europe. So okay. it's the um, historical sketches is like the short form of it. HS, if you search in the app. Um, and she talks about all of her trips. Um, and then there's another book by an Adventist author, Delafeld, which also is about Ellen White in Europe. You can also okay. find it in the app um, that outlines all of her stuff here. And that this, some of the stories and such, I give you more stories about her time here. It was a really, uh, she had some interesting stories, but it, we didn't, it was a very slow process. She said they're very skeptical, very difficult to reach. Okay. Um, the people, because of all the persecution in the past as well. Yeah. And also their feeling of we are some special people. We've been here so long and such. It's right. it's to give up going to your church is like giving up being who you are. Yeah. You know, it's like become to them kind of like Catholicism mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. Um, but Ellen White, she says here, manuscript releases, there will be a, at some time, I know not how soon, a disturbance in the valleys of Italy. Hmm. The confidence of the people in their teachers will be shaken. The eyes of many will be opened and the truth will be proclaimed among them. Amen. So, and there's other places where she said, I have another quote later, but um, where she speaks about how the three angels messages will be brought here to these valleys. And that people will take up their their stand under the truth again. Um, in so the we Waldensian. hope to be part of that, yeah, in the Waldensian valleys of the these, these Waldensian people. So we pray that we can be a part of that, mm. um, as well as training Adventist young men. Um, we will it will be a small missionary school. Um, yeah, here's here's a picture of the Waldensian missionary school of the past, mm -hmm. um, right here, and we are purchasing a building. I'll show a picture later. That's very close to this building, like a mm -hmm. stone's throw away from it. Okay. Um, we will do, be doing it for young men at first because we, it's a very small building that we have and we mm -hmm. only, it'd be like four young men maximum. We don't have space mm -hmm. more and we don't have a, a large, yeah, the facilities and everything to have mixed or, or larger groups or anything. So at the beginning it will be that. Um, and the idea will be really business evangelism based on some of the businesses that we've run. Mm -hmm. And in a way we're, you can bring business and evangelism together yes. to, to actually become tent makers as well as giving some training in public and personal evangelism, but to try to also make it a bit of an apprenticeship that yes. it's also some self doing, not just mm -hmm. classes the whole time. Mm -hmm. So it would be great if people who've already gone to a missionary school, this, this could be something like to add on at the, the end. Mm -hmm. And our goal of the missionary training is also that people who come through it at the end, we will help them also in connection with ASI and with different things to, tr and to help them to get funding that they can start and have their own business at the end. Because mm -hmm. the idea is we don't want them just to come through the training and then, well, now what do I do? And go back. That just happens to... so many times. And that is a huge problem, I think, with and, um, missionary training programs. So I, and that's I our goal is that, that. that our goal is that pe the, the young men that come here that if they if they come, they have already decided before and we speak with them and have interviews with them that they want to do this afterwards. Yeah. Not just, oh, I come, have an experience, but no, okay, afterwards, I mm -hmm. want to have one of these businesses yes. um, to run afterwards. Crazy um, that's the goal. So even if we have two students and at the end they start, that's that's better than we have four and, and none of them want to do anything at the end. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. These are the two buildings we're looking to purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not very big. Um, the, the one on the left, the little bit bigger one, that's where the missionary school will be. The other smaller one will be a small museum for liberty of conscience. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I don't know, one of the businesses that we've run 
in France. And that we also want to do here is this, I don't know if you've heard the concept of escape room, escape game concept. Yeah, I've heard of it. So it's usually a very worldly thing, sometimes very dark, sometimes, but yeah. the idea is we do it with prophecy. It's a team building game. So mm -hmm. people have an hour to escape from this room, finding different clues and putting together different puzzles and such mm -hmm. um, in order to escape. So the idea is, okay, we do it now with prophetic stuff from the Bible. Mm -hmm. People pay for that mm -hmm. and they get a little bit of the message from it. Wow. So this is one of the businesses we've done in France that's worked very well among people because secular people, they'll pay, they'll play a game. And because it's in a game and mm -hmm. because it's, it's a specific scenario, mm -hmm. it's okay when you speak about God and about his faith or, oh, it's about the history mm -hmm. of these people or whatever. Right. Um, you can speak to them about God because it's a game. Whereas right. on the street, people say, oh, no, I don't want to do anything. Right. And right. from this, we are able to fund ourselves for mission. For more conventional mission work so to say so we will have one also here is the goal and here i'll see what you can see on this little um, drone picture uh -huh. um, the waldensian school of the barbs where they train their missionaries there over on the left mm -hmm. and then where we want to, to purchase the two buildings it's really very close in okay. this little village of prada torno okay so god willing soon we will purchase the two buildings there okay very and good. what's What's amazing is a lot of tourists come through here mm -hmm. from all over the world. So from, from Portugal, from Brazil, from Germany, France, USA, um, everywhere. They come by through here. And so this idea of the little museum, little mm -hmm. escape room, that people who can come can have, because usually the people who come here are also interested in the Waldensians. Yeah. And then we share a lot of great controversies with people who come through here. So it's, it's multifaceted the mission to do here, mm -hmm. also to reach the local people, also to reach the tourists that come here, mm -hmm. because we have the great controversy in multiple languages. And here's the great controversy. And almost everybody takes it mm -hmm. because they're here for this history and they're Amen. interested in that history. Yes. So it's a strategic place that God blessed us with to live here for evangelism, where yes. people don't, people come to our house. We don't go to their house, so to say. Yes, yes, so yes, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And this is just kind of a little overview of the, the training, how it will be. The idea is that they'll first be here for two months mm -hmm. um, where they'll learn, they'll have intensive Bible training and also business evangelism training um, for two months, very close to the Waldensians. And what's interesting is the Waldensian missionaries, before they were ordained to mission, to ministry, they had to go and do foreign mission work. Mm -hmm before they and then they came back and you know only 50 50 percent of the of them never came back mm. we had a 50 50 chance of coming back because of persecution it meant right. a lot to be a missionary yes um so but our idea is okay let's take this same aspect and <clears throat> before we entrust them with this business before we really give them all of this they need to put in practice what they've already been learning mm -hmm. and be in a, a foreign country um, for three months of the training with specific goals that they have to do as well there mm -hmm. like an apprenticeship so they'll be also two by two working together also with some ministry there um, on the ground from the different connections that we have in mm -hmm. southeast asia or somewhere else or whatever where they can actually be practicing these things that they've learned very good and then see okay if they complete phase one successfully then they can go to phase two if they can place complete phase two successfully they go to phase three or for instance, they get involved in one of the businesses. And then if they complete all three phases, we see, okay, this is someone solid. This is someone, then we help them that they really have this business that they can mm -hmm. run themselves. And we're speaking like ideas, either like a mobile escape room that they mm -hmm. can have in a truck is one option. One thing, a vegan food truck is another thing we've done, a small mm -hmm. one we've done in the past. Um, that also works and brings for, uh, you know, you can live off of it mm -hmm. and use it directly for mission, mm -hmm. basically. And yeah, this is the quote that I want to speak about at the end. Um, the last quote I have anyways in the presentation. Thank you. Last things is here also what you see here, this pile of stones. This is up on the Castelluzzo. It's up on a mountain where they threw the Waldensians off mm -hmm. of a cliff there for their faith. And that's why they had this little monument there, but 
It says here in historical sketches from Ellen White, the angel that joins the third angel is to lighten the earth with his glory. Mm -hmm. There will be many, even in these valleys, where the work seems to start with such difficulty, who will recognize the voice of God speaking to them through his word and coming out from under the influence of the clergy will take their stand for God and the truth. So she's speaking about, about the Waldensians in the in the context of this. So she says that there will be those who will stand out when the when the loud cry goes forward. And I, I think also this is this is a a blessing and a, and a um for us to remember, even if we're not in the Waldensian valleys, but anywhere where we're in a difficult field, to continue to go forward, God has his people. Yeah. And then it continues. This field is not an easy one in which to labor, nor is it one that will show immediate results. But the miracle of God's mercy, working with man's human effort, will yet cause the truth to triumph upon the very soil where so many have died to defend it. Mm -hmm. Knowledge will be increased. Faith and courage will revive. And the truth will shine as the light of the morning all through these valleys. Mm -hmm. The old battlefield will yet be scenes of victories now unseen. And the adoption of Bible truth will vindicate the past fidelity of their fathers. Amen. So this is our prayer also for the valleys here, for the people here. Um, it said it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. And mm -hmm. it's a matter of us and being faithful and whoever else God sends to work here and in Italy and, and wherever else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, there's just, if there's information, if people want to know more, Mm -hmm. um about the project they can contact me they can visit our website um if they have if they want to donate if they just want to know more about the project if they're coming here to visit the valleys and say oh i wanted i would like to see all of these history things um i or there's another adventist lady here danielle um who didn't couldn't join us tonight but who can also um give tours and show the different historical places here okay Oh, that sounds like a very neat thing. Thank you so much for sharing. So let me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that. Thank you so much. I think that'll be very helpful for people to see. And um, yeah, it's such a blessing to meet you and to hear about what you're doing and uh, what yes. Frontline. Um, is it Frontline Messenger? Yes. Frontline Messenger is doing and the the school there and so what's the school going to be called? Just Frontline Messenger Training. Oh, that's what the school is going to be called. So, so the ministry is Frontline Messenger and we'll call the school just Frontline Messenger Training, mm -hmm. just to make it easy the connection basically. Frontline Messenger Training. Yes. Okay. Well, I I think well, let's we have been here for a good hour and a half or so okay. it went by very quickly but yes, it's... yeah it was a blessing to hear about this and um uh anything else i, I want to just share with people that you know as we see history repeating you know these people were very very faithful people and um they they stood up for truth for hundreds and hundreds of years and God bless them very much, but um, their descendants are no longer keeping Sabbath and don't see this anymore. And so I, I think it's going to be a beautiful thing to share the um, these Sabbath truths and the truths that the Protestant values that perhaps they have lost sight of uh, to to bring it to mind for them once again. And so we need to keep this goal in prayer. Uh, what you're doing is very, very important. And um, I hope that our people, you know, that we're learning the lessons that we need to learn, that we'll be faithful, that we, we won't be just going into ministry, um, you know, without thinking of the cost that we'll be uh, going to school and sending kids to school, thinking of them always doing mission work that they are a missionary no matter what they're doing in life so yeah and i think that would be yeah my appeal to people would be really that we need to have a little bit of a, a focus a shift in our in our focus in our thinking where that is the end goal in whatever we're doing like it doesn't like god has called us no matter if if you're working as a farmer as a businessman as a whatever 
that the end goal should be mission. Um, Whether that's, you know, not everybody's called to be an evangelist and preaching from the front, but everybody has their, their sphere of influence and the Waldensians, they use their sphere of influence and they trained their children. They knew that their children could be taken away from them. And so they gave them as much of the knowledge as they could, if in case that happens. Yeah. So they can still be like a little lad, uh, you know, no, a little, a little maid, right? From from the yes. story in the Bible, a Daniel, a Joseph, wherever they were. We don't know the stories how they ended. Right. Um, yes. But that's for us today. Yes. The yeah. needs to be the goal, not just to have uh, Ellen White. She says, right, an education that it, it's we can't just train our young people for respectable conventionality. Respectable conventionality. That's a good phrase. Because that's where we are kind of looking at as well. You know, you have a nice job. That's respectable. It's it's conventional. You're doing what you I think normal. most people, they're, they're content with respectable conventionality. And so it's a pat on the back. It looks good, right? You take care of your family. You have a nice life. You have a nice, you know, your respectable position in the church and this and that. But we want something beyond that. Yes. Something and it that, might not be respectable. No. <laughs> in the world's eyes it may not be considered respectable but in the eyes of jesus you know we want to we want to be well thought of in the eyes of heaven and so i hope that we will be coveting that more than anything mm-hmm. so, thank you so much brother max for sharing thank and- you too. thank you for having me on to share and um yeah. so i spoke a lot Um, no it was perfect it was perfect and uh yeah i will definitely be in touch with you and uh yeah it's going to be a blessing for many people to hear so yeah i just want to i'm i'm so we're so happy to share this and i hope that um your school many of our people will be interested in visiting and helping and maybe being a part of that school and getting training there so yes Uh, one more thing if, if people want to know more about like specifically about the history of the church in the wilderness and the Waldensians and such, aside from the great controversy, which if you haven't read the great controversy, you've got to read the great controversy. That's yes. the book for now. Yes. But another book that goes specifically with this period in the church in the wilderness is Truth Triumphant, a book by an Adventist author, B.G. Wilkinson. Um, he used to work for what's now Washington Adventist University. But in, okay. it's in the, from the 50s, the book. Okay. But beautiful book, Truth Triumphant. If you really want to get more into the history about how you had Sabbath keepers, like the historical documents of how, how they were like in Ethiopia and China and India and Ireland, and that's the book to read. It also it speaks about the Waldensians and really gives their historical outline. Thank you for that. I've heard of that book, but I've not read it. So I, I'll definitely look into that. Thank you so much. Well, why don't we close with a prayer and um, would you mind praying for us as we close? Sure. Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, we look back to the Waldensians and what they've suffered for, for their faith, what they gave up for you. And many of them, they didn't have, many of them didn't have long lives or they were very poor but they gave all that they had Mm. for you and you bless them. You help them and their names are written in the books of heaven along with the names of those that they've brought to faith Mm -hmm. because of their sacrifice. Father, that's all that we can ask of you. You would use us in the same way that we would not just live for this world because this world is just fading away, but that we would really make every decision in light of eternity Mm -hmm. we would not regret when we're in heaven in eternity we would make decisions that we would not regret then i pray for each one that's listening and i know that there are decisions and there's difficulties but i pray that you would help us that we would step out in faith and put all of our weight upon your promises Mm -hmm. they won't break they'll hold us that we would take our feet off of the world and put our feet on the promises of the bible Amen. We would follow spirit of prophecy that you would help father our church, our denomination, your church that in many ways has gone off track and has not been following the counsel for these times. Mm-hmm. But we pray that you would bring about a revival and that would start in our hearts, that we would start by simple childlike faith, 
mm -hmm. the follow after the blueprint, the patterns, the, the, the quotes the, that you've seen fit to give us mm -hmm. is a valuable treasure that we would trust it with all of our hearts because mm -hmm. it's from you. And we pray that you would work in the leaders in our churches and the leaders of the denomination. They would also do the same. For we know that we have your people in every level, everywhere, that want to follow. And we pray that you would use us to bring this gospel to the world in this generation, to bring the three angels' messages now, before time is too late. Mm -hmm. Wake us up, Father. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you Thank so you much.